Well, the dust has finally settled, and it looks like the Nashville Predators are officially headed in a new direction. We'll take a step back and look at the entirety of the Predators trade deadline, including a surprise signing right at the last hour, and what David Poyle thinks of this new direction. Is it really a rebuild? Plus, a couple of games got overshadowed by all the moves, so we'll take a look back at the Predators' past two games of action coming up today on the Locked on Predators podcast. Your Locked on Predators, your daily podcast on the Nashville Predators, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Predators your first listen of the day every single day. We are your free daily Nashville Predators podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Nick Morgan. I'm a writer and editor at onthefourcheck.com, and I have a partner in crime. You do. I'm Ann Kimmel. I'm a writer and editor at insidethepreds.com. <sighs> we can yeah. exhale, Ann. Oh, my gosh. We can exhale. That was insanity. That was insanity. Uh, uh, that was that was the uh, it's certainly a week. Mm-hmm. That that's for sure. Uh, we earned that fireball episode, and <laughs> I think there might be a fireball episode coming up just for the hell of it sometime soon. I'm here for this. I yeah. am so here for this. Uh, yeah, like who who do they have coming up? Just like some random win. It's like yeah, we, we got the we Canucks good one against the Canucks on the road tonight. There you go. Let's yeah, toast let's, to that. Let's toast to that. Uh, yeah, it has, of course, been a wild week because the Nashville Predators were probably one of the most active teams, if not the most active team, at the NHL trade deadline last week. Uh, you know the story by now. Nino Niederreiter, Matthias Ekholm, Mikhail Granlin, Tanner Janot, all shipped out a couple of huge significant pieces for the Nashville Predators. They get a lot of stuff back, a boatload of draft picks, including seven in the first three rounds this year, a new guy in Tyson Berry, and right at the last gasp, a new player in Rasmus Asplund, too, from the Buffalo Sabres, which will go down as David Poyle's last ever trade deadline trade. Not necessarily his last ever trade. Remember, he is here through the draft, and who knows what might happen. Uh, but it's safe to say we have finally hit an a new direction of the Nashville Predators. You and I have talked all season long. Like we don't really know what's going on with the Nashville Predators. Not just on ice performance, but what is the direction of this team? Is this a team that's going to give it one last hurrah in the playoffs or not? I think everybody knows right now the direction the Nashville Predators are headed in. David Poyle, with the moves that he made, has made it very clear. This is sort of a new, he likes to say reset. This is kind of a new start, a new direction. I don't think it's going to be quite as painful as a full rebuild would be, but there is no guessing anymore what the front office thinks about the Nashville Predators and what they're capable of or what they're going to do next. It is a whole new chapter and it's terrifying and it's also a little bit exciting all at the same time. Yeah. Uh, David Poyle spoke with the media, of course, after um the the moves on friday and there was a lot of context that came out of it but let's start with a bite you just referenced what is this is this a full rebuild are the predators going to tear it down try to do the dreaded t word for a couple of years try to just rack up top five picks are they going to bank on these young veterans try to make some bigger moves this offseason what is this is it a rebuild is it a reset a retool David Poyle talked about that on Friday. Let's listen to what he has to say. To say rebuild, I want to use re- reset. Let's let's kind of go in the middle here and let's say it's a step backwards to take a couple of steps forward. I think we all recognize that. I hope we recognize that, and I'm proud of. So I'll say it. You know, eight years in a row in the in the, in the playoffs, almost getting there just before that to win the President's Trophy, almost getting there before going to the Stanley Cup Finals. We're in the middle. There's nothing to be ashamed of and to be in the middle. I'm, I'm sure 
I mean, 20 other clubs would be happy to take our record in the last uh, eight, to t eight to 10 years. But my decision, our collective decision as an organization is that we don't want to just make the playoffs. We want to compete for the cup. And I, right now, I just think that we're, we're a club that just didn't have enough ammunition uh, to do that. So we're, we're making some changes uh, uh, that we hope are short term to make our long term future very, very bright. It's like this man read the Twitter comments for any Nashville Predators fan uh, over the past three years, really since the uh, that COVID ended. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, your, your thoughts on that, Anne? I like what he has to say. I do think it's funny. He seems very allergic to the term rebuild, but I also understand it because when we talk about a rebuild, you do talk about things like we're going to tank and collect draft picks, or this is, you know, when you're talking a full rebuild, you're talking about going way back and developing young players. So you're looking at like, you know, five years of a rebuild to get some players back in your lineup to make a franchise more competitive. And that's not where Nashville is necessarily. You know, Nashville has that young talent. We're seeing it already in recent games that we're going to be talking about here in just a little bit. So I do think it is a reset. I do think it is a step back to make some steps forward. And I appreciate that he acknowledged that, you know, despite being to the Stanley Cup finals, despite winning that president's trophy, the Predators these last couple seasons have been a team in the middle. And last year, you know, after the season wrapped up, he brought in Nino Niederreiter. He brought in Ryan Patrick McDonough to address what we thought were kind of these are the glaring holes that if we fill these holes, good things will happen. And we could see pretty early on that wasn't true. So I appreciate that he just is acknowledging what what is real about the Nashville Predators. You know, I think people felt like he just didn't have a good read of the team, which is funny considering he's with them all the time. But he did. And remember, these conversations were all happening in January. This wasn't like David Poyle. Um, you know, looked around the room and was like, hey, trade deadlines in a week. Should we do something like yeah. this was something that that these conversations, you know, he talks about these philosophical conversations happened in January with Barry Trotz and leadership. So, you know, it, it is what it is. The Predators are who they are and they're making moves to make them better. I, I respect that. I, I think a lot of people when they talk about David Poyle, it's like, oh, he's like, they're tricking themselves into thinking they're being competitive. And I, I don't think that's the case. I think a lot of the moves like getting Nino Niederreiter or trading for Ryan McDonough was to try to get that team into the competitive state. I mean, what did we say last year? You had Roman Yossi and uh, Philip Forsberg and Matt Duchesne having all these career years. Let's take out the debate on whether or not it was sustainable or whatever. But those are guys that were having the best level of play of their careers. And the big thing that killed the Nashville Predators was depth. So he went out and made depth moves. He was trying. It didn't work out. I think it's you can easily say it didn't work out. But at least he was trying to kind of make his team competitive. And now, you know, we're, we're at the case where the core itself is the problem. And that's when David Poyle, I think, had to pull the trigger. The other thing I want to mention here, Anne, is, you know, his comments on is it a rebuild, is it a retool? You know, for now, it's a step back. I think the key word in that whole thing was for now. Yes. And I think that is going to be the number one X factor with how the Nashville Predators moving forward is, is patience. Yeah. Because this is a thing that you're going to have to take one season at a time. Because, you know, everybody, there's been a lot of high profile Twitter people, um, you know, saying stuff like, well, they're they're going to continue being right in the middle until they trade UC Soros for a big package or, you know, they they need to trade these people because they're going to be bad for a few years. And it's it doesn't do anything good to, for them to be on their roster and keep them from, you know, from potentially being a lottery team. We can't have that conversation yet, because mm -hmm. the one thing we'll say about the Nashville Predators is this. They have. Uh, what Scott Wheeler called the 10th best prospect pool in the yes. NHL. A lot of those guys are not even pros yet. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You have some young guys on the team like Cody Glass, Phil Tomasino, even Yuso Parsonen, whose full extent, whose full potential, I don't think has really been explored yet. Agreed. So I think this is a, a thing where you're going to have to take it year by year. Now, if next year we go and it's it's just clear like Cody Glass is is what he is, kind of a middle of the pack guy. You know, it, it's clear that Phil Tomasino is not going to be able to, you know, step up or, or that there's some serious hole somewhere. Then maybe you have to take another for now step back. Maybe mm-hmm. you do have to trade somebody like UC Soros to really get a huge package and generate a rebuild and, and just kind of bank on a scar off behind him. But we're not there yet. For all we know, Cody Glass could be next year's Tage Thompson and just go mm-hmm. off. Yep. And have a massive season. You know, Phil Tomasino can develop. We don't know yet. So I think it is very important, both for the fans. I cannot stress that enough, fans. <laughs> please be patient. But also the front office yeah. to not try to get ahead of themselves here and take it year by year and see where you're at each and every year. Mm. Yeah, I agree with that. Where the Predators are now, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And I think they've been trying to sprint their way into and in, in deep into the playoffs since the Stanley Cup final. And I agree with you. I think we're, we're settling into more of a marathon pace. But I do agree. It's a year-by-year thing. You can't put together a five-year plan looking at what the Predators have now, even looking at what they have coming up as far as just an absolute – plethora of draft picks you really have to see what you have in hand the predators have young players in hand that we really need to see what they can do at the nhl level and that's going to come like you said in season chunks i agree with you yeah uh so the other big question is why now what was the timing that finally changed david boyle's mind and at this trade deadline he talks about that plus Remember the one player we're like is 100% going to get traded no matter what? Dante Fabro. Not only was he not traded, but he's back for one more season. We'll dive into that. Plus what we think of Rasmus Asplund, who made it. He, the Predators won uh, lone, actually pure, here's a draft pick a, a acquisition. We'll talk about him in just a second as well. But first, I want to mention today's show is brought to you by Athletic Greens. And of course, their product that both Ann and I use every day, AG1. If you may be asking yourself, what is AG1? It is one scoop in a cup of water each day. And with that, you absorb 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. It's a special blend of ingredients that supports your gut health, nervous system, immune system, energy, recovery, focus, aging, all of the things. I'm not saying that because we're getting paid to. Ann and I both got this in a wonderful little packet. We started taking it. Uh, I myself noticed an increase of energy. I started noticing uh, it's just better overall, like mental clarity, no brain fog in the middle of the day, uh, and, you know, a lot better digestive issues as well. And Athletic Greens and AG1, lifestyle friendly. So whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, daily free, whatever, it fits into your morning routine. Athletic Greens has over 7,000 five-star reviews online, recommended by everyone, professional athletes to leading health experts, and it costs you less than $3 a day. So right now, time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. All it is is one scoop in a cup of water each day. No need for all of those different expensive vitamins. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL network. Again, athleticgreens.com slash NHL network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right, Ann, we're talking trade deadline recap for the Nashville Predators. We've talked about all the moves they've made. We talked about whether this is a rebuild or not. The other big thing from David Poyle 
why now? Mm. This was this is a conversation in Rare. A lot of people for the last three years have been wanting to pull or the pull the trigger on a rebuild. They've been saying for years that it's you know first round of the playoffs, getting into the playoffs just isn't good enough. We need to make moves. So what was the X factor now that finally made David Poyle say we need to rip the band-aid off? He talked about that as well. And all, uh, I'll say it again, I think uh, in, in deciding to, to choose this route uh, at the trading deadline, meaning uh, trading some of our more, more veteran players, uh, it's a step backwards, but with certainly a quick eye on the future in terms of getting back to a competitive situation as soon as possible uh, in the near future. Having said that, in the last couple of games, I have been very pleased with uh, how our team has performed and uh, how, we're, how we're playing uh, right now. Uh, with a lot of these new players on the on the hockey club, and especially the younger guys, but uh, also the, the uh, I think it's important to point out the, the veteran players that we've retained, uh, how they've played. Roman Josie, Duchesne, McDonough, for example, have really done a, a good job. So let's see what happens in the next uh, twenty plus game. Your thoughts, Anne? You know, it had to be done. I also think part. It, it's interesting to me. I think there are a lot of little components that went into this. I do believe that Nashville, it was time to go in a different direction. And that's the most important thing to David Poyle. I think, you know, they all realized when they talked in January, this team needs to go in a different direction. We're not going to get where we want to get then. But you look at some of these other smaller X factors. You know, this is David Poyle's last year as the general manager of the Nashville Predators. You have the NHL draft is going to be here in Nashville. Um, and I think some of these little factors kind of fed into this. It's the right time. And, you know, David Poyle's getting ready to pass this off to Barry Trotz. And I do want to say this. Kudos to David Poyle, because I think he is handing this team to Barry Trotz in what is nearly an ideal situation, especially for a team oh, yeah. that, you know, the ideal situation is like, hey, here's last year's cup winner. We've changed nothing, you know, but this is the ideal situation for Barry Trotz to walk into because he has a core um, of players, a core of veteran players. He has just literally Barry Trotz's pants pockets are just overflowing with draft picks. Like they're just hanging out the side of his khakis. You know, there is all of this currency in draft picks in capital. There is cap space now. So I think the timing of it all really works out perfectly for the Nashville predators. I think Barry Trotz has been set up so well to go ahead now, take these reins. You've got all of this to work with. What can you do with it? And, you know, David Poyle was very honest in the press conference. People were talking about, like, you know, you were collecting all of these draft picks. And he's like, look, they're, this is assets. This is currency. You know, this doesn't necessarily mean that Nashville's going to use every single draft pick to draft and start developing young players. They may use these to bring in some already dynamic veteran player to speed things up. But he also was very clear and said, look, the draft is in Nashville. So we're going to see a whole lot of David Boyle, Barry Trotz, Nashville Predators as they host the draft in Nashville. So the timing of this, everything has come together. Like I think the realization of where this team is, what this team does and doesn't have, and then all of these draft picks and now setting up Barry Trotz to kind of take the team into their next chapter timing wise this this is almost a near flawless execution by david poyle yeah and i think for barry trotz he literally has a blank slate yeah which is something he wouldn't have had had he just taken over this team as it is you know in the middle of the season i mean this guy now has a lot to play with and you mentioned draft is in nashville they have seven picks in the first three rounds uh, remember, they have three second round picks next year and then two first rounders the year after that. So even if you don't want to take a big swing at somebody this year, mm -hmm. even if there's nobody really available for trade that you like, you still have a lot of extra capital to go out and take a big swing in future years. 
as yeah. well if you think you're getting close. So not not only, you know, just all the draft capital and all the cap space, but the way it's spread out uh, over the, the next few years, that adds to the flexibility as well. And to me, the bit, one of the big things about David Poyle's quote and was him talking about the youth and how well the youth has been. Yes. And I think that's important because, you know, what was some of the big things, you know, when people were criticizing how they handled Tomasino this year or how they handled the Tolfinan situation? It was, you know, there's a lot of ins and outs of it, but at the end of the day, it was just like, well, we didn't really have a space for them to come in and make, you know, the kind of impact we think we need them to make. You know, mm-hmm. there wasn't, you know, a spot in the lineup for them to do what they need to do to take that next step because of the injury situation, because of all that. Now there was, and you saw guys like Cody Glass and Tommy Novak, Yuso Parson, and, and then Phil Tomasino here recently, not just playing in the lineup, but playing in top six roles or, you know, in, yeah. in, in, after a while, a top nine role, all these scoring roles where they're getting power play time. And I, I think once David Poyle saw that, once he saw that, okay, there is enough youth here and there are enough veterans that I think there's a good mix between the two where my young guys are getting in situations where they need to succeed. Now I feel better about pulling the trigger. Because I don't feel like I have to rush them in. I feel like they can handle it. And I think that that was a key thing, too, is just the way things played out this year with some players getting more of a chance. I think that also made David Poyle more open to, OK, now we can really be aggressive in trying to get rid of of some of these veteran players. It's like the snake that has to shed its skin in order to grow. It was shedding some of the veterans so the young guys can come up. Yeah, no, I agree. There has to be space for them and there has to be more than seven, eight minutes a game for them to really understand what is required in the NHL. And like you said, the circumstances of the Predator season, especially right now with some of the veterans gone, with the number of injuries that they were dealing with, we're getting a, a jump start on getting these younger players playing time. We've seen Luke Evangelista in these last two games, which I think he has impressed in his last two games. You know, Cody Glass taking on a role. He's, you know, a number one center right now. You're seeing uh, Phil Tomasino, Yuso Parson, and even though he's out of the lineup just with injury, but we are seeing what these guys are capable of doing when they're getting regular time in the NHL. And there wasn't that opportunity when you're paying veterans and you know it's a known quantity and you want to see what your team has, you have to go that route first. We're definitely in a different chapter now. I will say this, Nick, and, and maybe maybe this is just me overreacting, but did you think at the end of the trade deadline, you know, even two months ago, would you have thought Nashville would be where they are? as far as situated for the future when it comes no. to you. Yeah. yeah. I find this whole thing so pleasantly shocking. I have seen teams where the Nashville Predators were take years to get to where the Nashville Predators got in what was really the span of a week. Now, some of it is they really took advantage of uh, that arms race, especially in the Eastern Conference, yeah. Tanner, you know. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's it's funny because we always said this was going to be a long rebuild. They mm-hmm. were re- they were stuck with these contracts. You know, they yeah. missed they missed the window to maybe do this in a more you know sustainable way. They may have to give up some draft capital to to you know get one of these big contracts out of their books, or you know retain a big chunk of salary, you know, not, not 250,000 with what they do with Matthias. Yeah. Eichel. And you get a yeah. first round pick of that is a masterclass. I am genuinely shocked that David Boyle was able to do what he did in the span of a week, because I have seen this time and time and time again in the NHL where teams just buried with, you know, big contracts for just kind of middle of the pack players like the Nashville Predators had. 
-hmm. I have seen them take years to have to dig themselves out of that situation. And that's why we all thought this wasn't going to be an easy rebuild for the Nashville right. when they, when they got there now, you know, they're in a better position to me, 100% uh, honesty than a lot of teams that have been doing this tank and rebuild thing for like two, three years now. I yes. mean, you know, like, you know, barring, you know, even better, like teams that, you know, the, the teams that are going to miss out on either Bedard or Fantilli, there are some teams in there that I would look at and say Nashville is way ahead of those guys and they had a better past couple of seasons than them by far. Yes, I agree. I would not have thought two months ago. It would have felt almost impossible two months ago to end this trade deadline. Look at where the Nashville Predators are. Look at the contracts that they've moved. Look at the cap space. Look at the assets they've gained. Look at the draft picks. I would have thought they can't do it. They can't move these contracts without retaining, you know, several millions of dollars and put themselves in a position. And I think what David Poyle has done, you you know, and, and look, I know David Poyle has taken a lot of heat. I almost don't want to say the name, but the whole Ellie Tolvanen thing, I was like, oh, my gosh, is this going to be his legacy? Friends, what he did at this this trade deadline, let that be what you take away, because this is near miraculous that yeah. he has set Nashville up the way that he has just, it's incredible. Shocking. Yeah. It is shocking. <laughs> Speaking of shocking, that's <laughs> Dave Pabro back from the Nashville Predators another year. We're definitely going to need to dive into that in a hot second. We are, but first want to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by another one of Nick and my great friends, our friends at built bar actually, just ordered another 12 count box last night under the watchful eye of my 18 year old who lives for these built bars. And if you are looking for a delicious treat, if you have a teenager who is always eating food and you want to give them something healthy, but it's also got to be something that they're going to eat. I'm pointing you straight in the direction of built bars. So what makes these built bars so good? Well, first of all, they're going to eat built bars because they're covered in a hundred percent real chocolate. That's right. It is real chocolate. So you're thinking you're getting a great treat. And you are because they come in these great flavors. We ordered, not going to lie, cookies and cream. That's one of our current favorites. But they have churro. They have peanut butter brownie. They have coconut almond. They have cherry barcia. And I don't know how Built does it, but these bars taste like a candy bar. But they maintain these amazing, healthy macros. So when you're eating a Built Bar, you're getting only about 130 calories. You're only getting four grams of sugar, but you are consuming a whopping 17 grams of protein. It's great for that post-workout protein that you need. And you don't need to wait around for a box either. We weren't headed to Walmart or Sam's Club, so we ordered online. But if you're running out, running some errands, go to Walmart, go to Sam's Club, and get your some built bars. If you head to Walmart today, you can walk to the pharmacy section, grab yourself a box of built bars. You can pick up a four count box of double chocolate or raspberry. Or if you think bigger's better and you go to Sam's Club, go in there and grab a 13 bar box with hit flavors like brownie batter or churro, another popular one here. You can thank me later. And of course, you can always order your Built Bars online like we did last night. You can go to Built.com. All right, Anne. When we started the trade deadline, we were like, there is one guy <laughs> who no matter what happens, Nashville Predators could wait to the summer. But the one guy that was guaranteed to be here was or be guaranteed to be on the trade block was Dante Fabro, who has been on the trade block for a year, it seems. Yes. Uh, he was a pending restricted free agent. No longer. Not only was he not traded, but the Predators have re-signed him to a one-year deal worth two and a half million. Um, you know, I, I don't hate it. You know, I, I don't yeah. hate it. And here's the, the reason why, Anne. Uh, I mean, number one, I feel like the entire injury situation, especially now Alexander Carrier is going to be out from, for it sounds like four to six weeks, which is 
you know, at this point, maybe towards the end of the season, who knows? Uh, you know, you, you traded Matias Ekholm, and there's just not a lot of people in Milwaukee right now in terms right. of young know, players who are ready. So right. that's one aspect of it. Uh, the reason I think everybody was surprised at this, just because it seemed like Dante Fabro had kind of fallen out of favor with John Hines a little bit and a little out of favor with the team. I mean, we saw him healthy scratch at times this year. Uh, you know, there's been games where he has just had like that – big noticeable mental lapse and then Last. just was benched for the rest of the game because of it. Um, but I think maybe with Barry Trotz coming in, this is somebody that Trotz goes, you know what? I want another look at this guy. Yes. Let's give him a fresh environment and see kind of what the uphill is. So, you know, to me, it's one of these no, you know, very, very low risk, but high possible award, you know, if it's a low, if it's a low risk, whatever, he's a free agent after next year anyway, and then you can trade him at next year's deadline. And then, you know, best case scenario is he does put it all together and he is a big part of the Nashville Predators for, uh, defensive core and really cleans up his game. And you have to remember too, Dante Fabro really has had kind of a more non-traditional path to the NHL. I mean, he played at Boston University and then he jumped, I mean, he jumped right in. He was thrown into the NHL for the Predators. So not AHL time. He's still, I think, only 24 years old. And, so and not and not only that, but remember, he came to the National Predators and jumped into the top four. I mean, they right. traded P.K. Subban after seeing this guy for six games and or like, yeah, this this is this. We feel strongly enough in this guy to take Subban's spot. Yeah. So it's been just kind of a, a quick jump start for Dante Fabro. And he really hasn't had the same type of development process that we see with a lot of other defensemen. And so I, I will say this. I do kind of like this, like. Give this guy a chance. He is not having his best season for sure this season. It's not his best season. But I don't think you can say that this kid is a bust by any means. And again, he's a kid. I know we've seen him around Nashville for several seasons now, but he's young. And so I like the idea of let's give him another year. And again, you've lost Matthias Ekholm. You know, Alexander Carrier is out. He is a known quantity. He is somebody that I think, I agree with you, I think Barry Trotz feels like this is somebody that, I, you know, I think let's take a look at him. Let's let's maybe spend some time doing some development on him in a different chronological order than yeah. maybe most of the other defensemen have had. But yeah, I don't, I don't hate this. I don't hate yeah. this. We were wrong, but I don't hate that. Yeah, we were wrong. Add that to the Kevin Lankinen <laughs> thing about us being very wrong about. Which uh, can we talk about that? Kevin Lankinen got re-signed. Kevin Lankinen did get re-signed for one more year, which yeah. uh, to me, right move. Uh, again, I, I think the, the fact that they were able to bring him back on a one-year deal with the season he's had, yes. I think it's kind of a coup because yes. I think, you know, with the way that goaltending money works out there, I think Kevin Lincoln easily could have asked for terms someplace or, or gone to someplace where it's like, I would like to compete for a starter. Uh, I, so if that part is, is very surprising to me. I also think that, you know, I would think the Predators would rather have a scar off, spend another full year as a starter in Milwaukee rather than be a backup for UC Saros, uh, okay. just because of the lack of hockey he had played before this season. So yeah, very, very happy that, uh, Kevin Lincoln is back. Uh, the other move, man, is the one that was kind of snuck in there right at the it end. Was. Kind of come out of nowhere. Uh, Rasmus Asplund coming oh, over what? from the Buffalo Sabres, uh, intriguing option, a big hitter. He had five hits in his debut game against the Chicago Blackhawks on uh, Saturday night. Uh, what do you think of that move, Ann? Here's what I think happened with that move. I think that David Poyle caught a glimpse of our Toast to Matthias Ekholm episode in which I was mourning. And he said to himself, look, let's go out there and pick up a young Swede and bring in because we've taken a Swede from 
from Anne. Yeah. And so that's what he did. And so I appreciate that, David Poyles. So thank you for respecting the need to have more Swedes on the team. Um, but I will say this. I thought it was a really good debut. I thought it was it was so funny. It literally kind of happened almost in the background. <laughs> yeah. So it the was most like... overshadowed. Uh... <laughs> Especially yeah. with Tyson Berry getting his uh, first goal as a Pred that same day, too. Yeah, so it was kind of an overshadowed thing. But I think this is a, a very interesting – I think this is a very interesting acquisition. Like, let's see what happens. And I, and I do think when you lose somebody like Tanner Janot, this is the type of player that you go out and you say, okay, well, let's see what you've got. Let's see what you bring in. So I kind of like this move. Yeah, you can not have enough Swedes. Hadn't been having a good year this year. It was healthy, scratched a lot uh, in Buffalo. But you look at his numbers last year, and this guy was like a defensive stalwart, mm -hmm. uh, like a very good guy. And again, if he can, if he can find his form, that's a good, uh, like you mentioned, Tanner Janot replacement, bottom pair penalty killing guy. Uh, so yeah, don't hate that at all. Mm -hmm. um, and as as we look back uh, on the entirety of the trade deadline. What letter grade, real quick, would you give mm. the Nashville Predators? I give the Nashville Predators an A minus. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel that good about what happened. Would not have imagined that the Predators could land where they have landed post trade deadline with a look to the future the way that they have it. The only reason it's not an A plus for me is that we had to give up Matthias Eckholm. Yeah. Well, you got a sweet back, so it all works out. I did sweet for sweet. What yeah. about you? How do you? Yeah, how I would you think, evaluate I, it? I think a solid A. Mm -hmm. I I can't think of anything else you really could have done better. So yeah, yeah I mean that's that's a solid A. Yeah. Uh, and now the Nashville Predators are in a much brighter future. Let's see if that bright future carries over till tonight when the Nashville Predators take on the Vancouver Canucks. On uh, tomorrow's Locked on Predators, we'll actually get back to some actual hockey watching. Uh, we'll have a full recap of tonight's game for you tomorrow. And where can people find your work? You can find my work online at InsideThePreds.com. You can find me on Twitter at ANK underscore Mama on Ice. You can find me on Twitter at underscore NS Morgan or on OnTheForeCheck dot com be sure to also follow the podcast on twitter lo underscore predators and hit that subscribe button however you're listening to us that's going to do it for us on today's locked on predators podcast thank you for making us your first listen of the day we'll be back tomorrow with an all-new episode see you then